Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, March 25th. And today we're going to take a break from or a pause, I should say, from the throw of the chase. And we're going to move on over to D.B. Cooper because we've got our friends Cynthia Meacham, John Limbaugh on the show. And John has a brand new book called Where Was Skip? So we've all read it. It's chock full of information for you D.B. Cooper conspiracy conspiracy theorists out there. Or just people who just want to know, you know, who maybe is a possible another candidate. So thanks for coming on, YouTube. Yeah. So um, for those of you that are in DB Cooper community, I am K Pro. That's Calazars, and we talk usually treasure hunts. We do storage auctions and a few other things. Um, but um, you guys all know Packer if you're in the DB Cooper community because he um, dropped this book, and then Cynthia Meacham, she's a treasure hunter, but he became kind of. Um, I don't even know if Packer knows this, but a little bit infatuated with this book. And so has tons of questions and is really dug into it. And so I said, why don't we come on the show together? Because I have some questions, but kind of like Cynthia and I, we've talked about the book a bunch of times on the phone. Um, I didn't live through this era and I am a little bit um, once removed from political talk from this era. She kind of lived through okay. some of this time. She was very young. Can you not hear? What's going on? I already went out. Oh, no. Can you, one, two, three. Can you, can you hear us, John? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I can't hear you. So it's going to be on your end. I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, there you can hear me, right, Cynthia? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we're going to figure it out. You muted. Let's see if you can unmute now. I see the red. At the, okay. so I'm unmuted right now. You guys now can hear me, running. but I can't hear you. So you can't hear us. Yeah. You could, you did though, right? Yeah, you did. How about if I uh, log out and I'll log back in? Yeah, yeah, that'll work. That'll work. We can just do it without Packer Jack, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, while he's doing that, I'll do the rest of the intro. So here is how uh, we think might be best to walk through the book because it it's a novel. It's not like The Invitation, 20,000 words. It's a full novel. Um, and it there's some parts that I think are pretty thick, um, kind of mid to the end of the book. Um, so we're going to just go chapter by chapter, get a quick summary of what the chapter's take major takeaway is. And some of it's um, very basic. Here's D.B. Cooper. Here's what happened at the beginning. But then by the end, I think the takeaways will be important. Like I had to look up some of the people um, with all the Warren Commission and things that happened there. That was I think he laid it out well, but I think it'd be good to have a takeaway. Um, I recommend the book. Um, and I'm excited um, that he is going to be able to answer some questions. So we will do a chapter kind of summary, and then Cynthia and I are prepared either with, here's my key takeaway or thing I saw interesting, or Packer, we have a question for you regarding, you know, whatever that is. And John in our group is called Packer Jack. So that's like, I'm Christy, but I'm K-Pro. Cynthia is just Cynthia. Mike's Calazar. So We'll call him Packer. So if you guys uh, wonder why we're calling this esteemed author, John Packer, that's um, he collects Packer gear. He's a big Packer fan. And just so everybody knows, we are going to get back to the treasure hunting amusement park on Thursday. So we will have a show scheduled for 6 PM Thursday to talk about some other things going on. Yeah. We got a, several big updates. Our lions are roaring for those um, <laughs> treasure hunters. You know what that means. And when the lions roar, we got to talk about it. So we're going to do a special show. Thursday because on Monday the invitation launches and that's what we're going to do um, an invitation show on Monday um, so I think that is all the introductions let's see if John good. can you hear us can you hear I us can hear you. we're okay. good good deal yeah. I okay. like that statue back there that's pretty awesome <laughs> where'd you get that, that is actually uh pilfered from Ryan Burns that is an actual little DB Cooper with the Looney Tunes money bag tied to him oh so, that's cool yeah. nice. it's kind of like a good luck charm and for those of you in the Forest Fang community, uh, Ryan Burns is the equivalent of Ryan Bavetta. The like one of all knowing can go and right. grab some rare piece of um, FOIA or 302 data in a second. And you go, how do you do that? Um, good guy, really like straight shooter. Here's the facts. Um, and, and he's kind of getting funny too. You guys are doing brackets and all, or he's doing brackets and stuff I saw on his YouTube show. So um, I really like him. Um, okay. Yeah, Roaring Lions, USA, China. Um, so we have a lot to talk about on Thursday. So we're double show this week. And then next week, the invitation launches. And then you'll see on Thursday why we have so much more to talk about. We might go to two shows 
Uh, we don't know. But tonight, yeah, from now this on, is what yeah. we're talking about. Um, so let's dive right in. Your introduction is really an introduction about kind of um, your philosophy. And I think this one is really important because you, I'll let you say it, um, but the takeaway is so many people in the DB Cooper community, it's like our Forest Fan community, they have their solve and they'll only focus mm -hmm. on their solve and that's it. And I think you do a really good job in kind of letting us know this is someone to consider and here's some things to consider, but you're not trying to throw this down anybody's throat, right? Yeah, I mean, it's fun when you're talking about a solve to a treasure hunt. Well, not fun when you hear the hundredth one like Mike has had to, but <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking about potentially as no one of legal authority, bringing out someone's name publicly, accusing them of a federal crime, of air piracy and potentially bringing a bomb onto an airplane. Think about if you were on a commercial jet and after you got off, you found out somebody was on there claiming to have had a bomb while you're on the flight. So I've always, in the D.B. Cooper community, have always just considered people persons of interest. I don't think anybody who's non-law enforcement has a right to call someone a suspect. Now, I'm kind of in a, in a very small percentage, although I think it's growing because, Christy, you being involved in that community know that there have been some family members of other quote unquote suspects that have been very upset that members of their family have been brought forth by people and put out in newspaper articles and in the media stating that a person believes that their loved one was D.B. Cooper who has no history of criminal activity. Um, there's no evidence to put them in Portland that day, put them on the flight, so on and so forth. So uh, I think also this, this is just the honest assessment that Larry Carr, the FBI agent, who's part of the, the group that we're in, um, you know, has stated that you can come up with anybody who kind of fits a lot of characteristics of D.B. Cooper, even fits most of the char characteristics. But can you put them in Portland? Can you put them on that plane? Is there any direct evidence that connects them to that or anything after the crime? You find a $20 bill, uh, pieces of shroud line, the actual letters. Um, notes that he passed to the flight attendants and asked back the, the uh, matchbooks that he took back. And of course, we know one of the most frustrating things about the Cooper case, for those of you that aren't aware, is that they had eight cigarette butts from Dan Cooper on this flight. Back in the early 1970s, they only tested for fingerprints and any kind of evidence on the outside of the cigarette, and there wasn't DNA evidence back then. Now, there are cases from the 1960s and the 1970s that get solved with cigarette butts, but unfortunately, these cigarette butts were sent to the FBI office in Las Vegas. And I don't know what happens in Las Vegas, but that FBI uh, in Las Vegas, the office there actually destroyed those cigarette butts. There's literally, Ryan found the actual 302 FBI document that says that the cigarette butts were destroyed. So talk about a sad horn on that that this case probably would have been solved by now, or at least we'd have a full DNA profile of Cooper to match up with all the DNA that people are now submitting throughout the country of a potential family member, like other crimes I'm sure you guys have heard of and have been aware of that have been solved mm -hmm. uh, that way. Most notably the one uh, that Patton Oswalt's late wife was involved in where they were able to use DNA and, uh, and match it up that way. So. Yeah, that's kind of my take on it, Christy. Thanks for the uh, introduction and sorry about the audio problems in the beginning. Um, I'm really just throwing Lauren Hall out there as someone who I'm even surprised checks as many boxes as he does. And it's been a real whirlwind since this book came out just about a month ago to find out that a lot of people that have been doing this for 20 or 30 years in the Cooper community think of him as a serious, in their words, suspect for D.B. Cooper and for Ryan Burns, who's a Cambridge-educated attorney who's put together this matrix of analyzing suspects, Warren Hall has gone to the top of the list, which is just stunning to me uh, when you think about all the suspects that have come up over the years in the Cooper investigation. So that's great. And then in October and November of last year, I got taken for a ride. I'd never thought I'd go in. And that's the whole other half of this book, which is the question about uh, the Kennedy assassination and where the title of the book comes from, Where Was Skip, basically comes from uh, a man named uh, James Pappas, um, the quote unquote family member that I worked with. And that's what we call it in the Cooper community if you're working with someone who was associated or a family member of a person of interest. 
is now an 80 year old man, but he was 19 years old at the time of the Kennedy assassination. His older brother, the middle of the three older brothers that were grown when Skip Hall met his second wife, their mom, Ann Pappas, um, in 1960, and, and he, she was 37, he was 30, so the boys were already grown. James Pappas was a sophomore at UCLA in an anthropology lecture. Uh, someone came in, handed the professor a note. The professor announced to the class that President Kennedy had been shot and killed in Dallas. And the first thing that James Pappas thought was, oh, hell, where's Skip? So think about that. If that's a person that is your mom's new husband and his first thought was that he's a very both of these men are all three of the Pappas, what I call boys now in their 80s and older, uh, have been highly successful, uh, you know, very credible. Um, James was the uh, dean of the business school at the University of South Florida. And I got I got to meet them basically through an article that was done in 2021 by the former chairman of the Tampa Bay Times, Paul Tash, who wrote an article in 2021 about the need for all of the records from the Kennedy assassination to be released, and that these two men now pushing 80 approached him and said, after the assassination, Lauren Hall came home and handed John Pappas a Carcano rifle. And for those of you who don't know, a Carcano is an Italian carbine. It's the same model from the same armory of the weapon that's associated with Lee Harvey Oswald and the Kennedy assassination. So um, John held on to that rifle for 57 years. Uh, back in the Clinton administration, President Clinton had... Um, passed that all, all Kennedy uh, assassination records would be released by a certain date. That didn't happen. And you go all the way to the Trump administration where everybody thought they would be fully released under Donald Trump. That still didn't happen. And now we're in the Biden administration and there's still estimated to be about 15,000 records that should be made public by now associated with the Kennedy assassination that haven't been made public. That's what prompted the Pappas brothers to go to Paul Tash that's what prompted me to get in touch with Paul Tash, not knowing if he'd return my call or my email. He did. He's, he's an incredibly generous person with his time uh, based on his credibility as a journalist leading the Tampa Bay Times and now the Pointer Institute in State of St. Augustine, which is for ethics and journalism. He's on the board there and obviously retired. Uh, but he said, I think I don't know if the older brother, James, will want to talk to you, but I think John might. And he goes, I'll pass his information. And that afternoon, our new executive assistant at my office came in with a sheepish look on her face around 3 p.m. and said, there's a guy on the phone for you who wants to talk to you about the Kennedy assassination. And they had no idea I was working on this book. So, uh, so John actually contacted me and I uh, called him back. We chatted for about an hour and that started a, a relationship. Um, we built a bond of trust and then a friendship that's gone on now since uh, November of last year. Um, that I was able to tell his story and his brother's story in this book as well, too. John Pappas is convinced that Lauren Skip Hall was involved in the conspiracy surrounding the Kennedy assassination. Hmm. Uh, my second goal with this book, besides the D.B. Cooper uh, uh, question on could he have been D.B. Cooper, should he be considered a person of interest? So where was Skip on November 24th, 1971? Is where was Skip on November 22nd? 1963, because I then researched his alibi for that day, and I researched any information I could find that would have people putting him in uh, Dallas, Texas. And there's a chapter in the book called Bye Bye JFK Alibi. It's a play on the song by Don McLean that I mentioned earlier in the book, Bye Bye Miss American Pie, where I actually, in outline form, go through Paul's alibi and break it down by what I found, and then by anything that would actually put him in Dallas, and therefore then ask the reader, do you believe that with the information that uh, I present that kind of takes apart his alibi with factual information and then having three now, unfortunately, deceased people that testified, affidavits testified to the House Select Committee of Assassinations, that Lauren Hall was in Dallas that day. And now with John Pappas saying, I know where I was that day. I know where my brother was that day. And I know where my mom was that day. And Skip was not in California. So you put all of that together. And I thought that that was really important. Uh, I don't go as far as myself personally to say that I think Skip Hall is part of the assassination, that he fired a weapon that day or was with Lee Harvey Oswald that day. 
But I do ask that question that I believe I proved that he lied to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, where he had to testify for two days in 1997, that he lied to the FBI. He lied to Jim Garrison, who Kevin Costner portrayed in the famous movie JFK by Oliver Stone. Paul was subpoenaed by Garrison, defeated it because California ruled that he didn't have to travel to New Orleans. New Orleans wouldn't have jurisdiction uh, to, to make him come from California to go all the way to New Orleans. He later agreed to go on his own. Um, and then he also lied to the FBI and uh, Warren uh, Commission investigators who were investigating uh, the Kennedy assassination right after it happened in 1964. So that's where was Skip. Those are the two questions. Where was he on November 24th? 1971, and where was he on November 22nd, uh, 1963? I think I've proven the second one. I don't know about the first one. Yeah, well, and I think the press um, went as far as to say um, he was potentially the involved in the assassination. So it's not like you're oh, absolutely grabbing something that, but you put you bring a lot more evidence to it, or evidence that I couldn't. I tried to. Um, Google around and research around. And so anyone that thinks that they can just grab something off the internet, um, I think John has done a very thorough job of all the information that's in there. And that's one of the other things that we'll try, we'll jump into the book now, but you not only provide what your opinion is of whatever the article is or piece of evidence is, you actually include the evidence then, which is nice. Right. So there are pictures in the book that are actual pictures that are actual clippings from newspapers, um, and that's helpful because then, you know, as I try to get, okay, let me see if I'm going to interpret this the same. I don't have to go and research down and find that article. It's there in the book, which is really nice. So, okay, let's jump in. Chapter one is really an introduction for those of you that don't know anything about um, the D.B. Cooper community or D.B. Cooper and what happened. Um, you know, he's he basically is a skyjacker. Um, I think the key pieces, though, that become important later is um, he asked for the the stairs being down was a big one. Um, the DNA, unfortunately, um, well, the tie-in things will become important, the pieces of evidence. Um, but really that that aft stairs being down really kind of gave us some insight that he had some aviation knowledge. Some people believe that means military then. Um, some people just say aviation in general, whatever that looks like. Um, and it kind of gives us the, the key pieces um, of what happens and why we think he jumped at a certain part with the pressure bump and that sort of thing. Is there any pieces that I didn't, but you did talk about the cigarette butts in there, the clip on tie, um, flight 305, kind of all the particulars. So um, is there anything, Cynthia, that you either wanted to ask or John that you wanted to highlight in this particular uh, chapter? No, it was very detailed and easy to understand. I'm good. Yeah, I think I the one thing because like um, <laughs> nice, wow. Um, by the way, thank. The, I just want to. I haven't done it yet. I want to thank the three of you, Cynthia, first of all, for reading the book and the wonderful review you put on Amazon. I really appreciate it, and, and Mike and Christy, as always, for having me on. So thank you. Um, yeah, that was really a chapter, uh, Christy, just to lay out in a very quick summary what. Norjack was, and Norjack is the FBI name for Northwest Orient Hijacking, uh, which is the hijacking of Flight 305. So it lays out what happened between Portland and Seattle, and then Seattle and the time that D.B. Cooper uh, jumped from an airplane with a parachute on. Um, I'm a pretty old guy, so it's fun to remind those that are younger than us that um, it was way different back then. You walked into an airport, you could be smoking a cigarette, you could walk right up to the counter, not have to show ID, pay for a ticket in cash one way if you want. You can make up a fake name if you wanted. Nobody checks your ID. You can go hang out in the terminal, smoke more cigarettes, and walk on a plane and pick a seat wherever you wanted to, depending upon the type of flight. If it was with a bomb, without a bomb, we don't know. I mean, yeah. Right. With a suitcase with a bomb in it, no metal detectors. So right. I often mention that because I think for people that are even 40 and younger, or maybe at least 30 and younger, it was such a different world back then. Um, that that uh, this was really what we call a bank robbery in the air, if you think of it that way. If you don't think it was associated in any way with the federal government and this was just a person committing a crime, it really was a very imaginative bank robbery in the air uh, that right. this person committed. Right, and didn't need to be, needed to be planned, but not at the same level. If you are trying to get 
a bomb on a plane and all of those things and hijack, it's a whole different ball game now. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it was easier because there's a lot more security measures in place, especially um, post 9-11. So, okay, let's move on to chapter two then. Um, for me, you kind of answered this question, but I think it's, um, I wanted to ask one question on it um, where you're just um, really, you're talking about the data uh, that the assassination happened, but you reference in this chapter in 2021 that there was an article um, titled um, basically why the secret records need releasing. You touched right. on this a minute ago under Trump, under Biden, under everyone, everything's supposed to be released right now. Can you give us the Reader's Digest version of why haven't they? What ha what did Trump say, if anything? Like, why isn't everything out? If legally it's supposed to be, a lot of people are pressing for it. I know there's new podcasts and people that are coming out to say, this should happen and it's illegal. What is going on? I don't know the answer to that. What is the reason that, you know, basically the law is being viol violated and the information is not out, the documents are not out? Well, it's a great question. And I certainly haven't seen them, so I can't give you a definitive answer either, except to say what I've heard. Uh, there's kind of two schools. One is that, yeah, that stuff will eventually come out, but it's not going to help anybody figure anything out in regards to the assassination. You have to remember that this was this was uh, not only a tragedy that day in Dealey Plaza in Texas, but it was a stain on the Secret Service and it was a stain on the CIA. Uh, and it was a black eye for the United States of America. And so anything that could be associated with embarrassing the CIA, embarrassing the Secret Service, and the few people that are hanging on, you know, there's a woman named Ruth Payne who uh, helped Lee Harvey Oswald get his job at the Texas School Book Depository, spoke Russian. Many people believe she was a CIA agent. Marina Oswald was living with her at the time because Lee and Marina had been separated uh, at that time. And people believe that Ruth was one of the handlers that may not have known that what was going to happen to Dealey Plaza that day, but had been co-opted to be taking care of the lifestyle side of Lee and Marina's life. Um, and she's still alive. She's hanging in there in her 90s. In fact, uh, there's a documentary you can buy on Amazon about Ruth Payne and find out about the story and see where the their Carcano rifle was supposedly kept in her garage. There was a treasure trove of Minox cameras and all kinds of potential spyware in the Payne's garage uh, there. Uh, and that house is actually... Uh, now purchased and part of a historical site. It's a historical site that you can go visit, like a museum, Ruth Payne's house. So she's still alive. Uh, Paul Landis, who just shocked the world in September of last year, coming out with a book before the 60th anniversary. He was the second Secret Service agent to get to the limousine. He was one of the four Secret Service agents standing on the floorboards of the car behind President Kennedy uh, in the limousine. And uh, he was one of the favorites of the Kennedy family. In fact, the majority of his time as a Secret Service agent during the presidency was taking care of Caroline, uh, John John, and Jackie. And uh, he came out with a book in September at the age of 88 and said, oh, by the way, I've never told this story, but I actually found a bullet that was on the car between the leather of the back seat where Mrs. Kennedy and the slumped over President Kennedy were. That he and it was wedged between the back of the leather and the trunk, and that he picked that bullet up and took it into Parkland Hospital and actually put it on the gurney by the president's foot. So talk about conspiracy theories gone wild. You've had decades of people trying to make the magic bullet theory work, and now you have one of the Secret Service agents who was on site saying, "Well, I found this bullet, and it was behind Mrs. Kennedy." So if you don't believe that there could have been a bullet behind the president and Mrs. Kennedy, you have to assume that that bullet that went all the way through the president and John Connolly then somehow made it all the way back behind them, which is crazy, right? Well, so you can't even believe um, the magic. I mean, I remember the magic bullet theory of, okay, and then it had to go this way, and then and now it has to go all the way around. Yeah, that it's already not believable, and now let's add a layer of not believable on not believable type of thing, yeah. So I, I wasn't really even thinking about the Kennedy stuff a lot. I mean, I had really looked into it in my youth and kind of grew up with it. Um, but once I met John Pappas and heard that story, I started searching news articles. So think about where I'm at trying to potentially write this about this guy being D.B. Cooper. 
And now I'm talking to a family member who's telling me he thinks that this guy definitely was involved in the Kennedy assassination. And then, then I'm reading Paul Landis's story about this new bullet and I'm going, this is just crazy. And so uh, it's, it's been an interesting ride that 60 years after the president's president Kennedy's assassination, there's still new evidence coming out. There's still documents that should be released that aren't released. And yet in our textbooks in school, your kids, my kids are now in college, learned that there was a lone gunman and that there was one guy who killed him. Uh -huh. Yet, in the survey that Gallup does every year of 1,400 American adults, this last one in November, only 29% of the country think that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And think about that. That means basically seven out of 10 don't believe it was Lee Harvey Oswald acting alone. So, that's really interesting when you think about the dynamics of what is still taught to our children in yeah. school about the assassination and that there's that dichotomy of what adults believe, yet nobody finds it important enough to add that to the historical record at this point well, in Texas. The book that you gave me is kind of pre-reading. Um, I don't know where it is, but the JFK book, it was so helpful because it made me realize I now can follow your book pretty much. Yes, that's the book. I didn't realize how much evidence there was. I know there was a lot of theories. He didn't act alone. Pretty much after reading that book and looking at the evidence, there's no way he could have acted by himself, in my opinion, after seeing the actual evidence. And I think that's where this story gets sensationalized. And we lose a lot of the, we have a lot more hearsay and opinions than looking at the evidence. If you just look at the evidence, there's a lot of things clear, but people disappeared. People magically died unexpectedly. I mean, this was back in the time and I wasn't born um, at this time, but I know that there was, this was a, a bet, like you said, this was a bad mark on everyone. Cause there was, I won't even say shenanigans cause that makes it too lighthearted. There was some really bad things happening to people associated with who actually assassinated JFK and people were scared. And I mean, I know um, in that book, um, Jackie Kennedy says flat out, it was some oil businessmen in Texas, and I will never speak of this again. And that's all she has ever said, which is, I mean, it, it's a, it, it's amazing how serious um, it really is on what has come out, uh, what cover-ups there have been, who's lying to the government, who's, you know, that sort of thing. So Yeah, I always caveat, because I don't really like to go down the JFK rabbit holes of what actually happened that day and who was involved, because I don't. My personal belief is the mud, the waters have been so muddied now for six decades and even the evidence and the, how things were collected and all the things that took place and nothing's going to change the fact that the president was killed that day. Um, I also think there were some very good patriotic Americans, service people um, in Bethesda that were either commanded and told to do jobs and also really thought they were doing the right thing for the country. They didn't want to have World War III with Russia over this. They didn't want to have, um, you know, action with Cuba or take action against Cuba um, and thought they were doing the right thing. And maybe they were. I don't know. But, you know, for there's, there's people that are the contrarians uh, to anything other than Lee Harvey Oswald doing it and being the lone gunman that you you – that if you don't agree with them, that you have to somehow agree that 200 to 400 to 1,000 people were all in on this. Yeah. I believe that the Kennedy assassination is really a book of chapters, things that happened before, things that happened in the lead up, things that happened during it. And I don't think anybody was a mastermind of the whole thing uh, or was, but I also don't believe everybody read every single chapter of that book. And some people may only have been part of chapter one and some people know seven and 11. And that's how you can explain that as you as you compartmentalize it, you know, why the autopsy happened the way that it did in Bethesda, why what happened at Parkland happened the way that it did, why the investigation at Dealey Plaza happened the way it did, what was the lead up, what was Lee Harvey Oswald doing in the lead up to it. Those are things that you can look at, but as many people very wise, including our friend Jackie, who stayed with Forrest and drank brandy with him. Um, she's another person that said, don't waste your life looking into this too much. You know, and that's why she said, I'm never going to talk about it again. Yeah. Um, 
because there's so many people that have spent decades, mm -hmm. um, just like we know people in, in the Fen community that, you know, whether it's missed fortune or took things too far or got too involved and it affected their personal life, that, that there's many people that have done that with the Kennedy assassination as well, too. Well, that's a perfect segue to chapter three. This is your only reference. Um, even though there are a couple chapters that were taken out about Forrest, they are posted on our Discord. But you start this chapter saying um, when you were investigating the Cooper case, um, you this is where Forrest Fenn comes up um, in the book um, about his treasure. So while you were researching this, is this when you stumbled upon the treasure hunt? No. Uh, this book wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Forrest Fenn and the Thrill of the Chase. And the reason okay. why I say that is because I hadn't even been thinking about D.B. Cooper since Brad Meltzer had done his episode on Decoded about Kenny Christensen, who was another suspect. And I kind of watched that, and then I kind of lost track of the Cooper case again and wasn't really even thinking about it. But as I got involved with you guys, um, you know, I heard about Mindy and Stephanie's book and you know, then what Alan Kelly was doing and then the stuff with ha ha ha. And then I re-engaged with people like Nikki Broughton and the people in the D.B. Cooper community. And it ramped right back up for me because I had okay. looked into it for so many years before then. But I don't know if I would have ramped back up into D.B. Cooper. I think I can honestly say I don't think I would have ramped back up to the extent that this would have happened without, you know, people talking about Forrest Fenn being involved in the D.B. Cooper case. And so I know that sounds crazy to people in the Cooper community, and it sounds perfectly logical to you guys because we walked down that path together. But, um, you know, that that's really the truth of, you know, people ask, was Forrest involved in it? Was Forrest D.B. Cooper? Did Forrest write ha, ha, ha? Was Skippy involved? All those questions came up, and that got me looking back into the Cooper case, going to CooperCon like you've gone to. Have you gone twice now? Christy, right. so, right. And I'm so, going I mean, this year where John is going to be one of the speakers. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then meeting people like Ryan, who's become a really close friend of mine and a trusted confidant. Uh, Eric, all the people in that community. Um, yeah. And I really enjoy them. I enjoy the, the Cooper community. Uh, it's a great group of people. And uh, I, I would urge anybody who isn't part of the D.B. Cooper Mystery Group on Facebook to join. It's a very welcoming community. And... Uh, a ton of really smart researchers uh, are part of that. And part of the Citizen Sleuth group is part of that. That's the group that's yeah. looking into the particles on D.B. Cooper's time. And things yeah, like Tom K. and that group. So, yes, make, make no mistake about it. Um, you know, the, this book would not have come to fruition had I not stumbled onto you guys in April of 2020. And so it's all your fault. <laughs> Blaming you. Okay, so chapter three really introduces us to who is Loran Eugene Hall Sr. Um, and I have a couple questions, but did you have anything on this chapter, Cynthia? I know we're still kind of in, in the introduction portion of the book. No, I think I think John really answered everything that I had questions about by the end of the book, except for one that I will save until the end of the show. Okay, okay well, the cool part is the thing I really liked about this chapter is it goes into and summarizes in bullet points. Here is kind of, I call it the 30,000 foot view. Here is why this suspect or this person of interest has so many points that are relevant to this case. Um, and then I absolutely love the picture that you included. Uh, many people wonder why he was Dan Cooper. He's not actually D.B. Cooper on his, he never dubbed himself D.B. Cooper. The, the media did that and it just took off. Um, but he, there's actually a picture of his elementary school, which was called Cooper Elementary, um, which I just thought was perfect, especially since you have the actual pictures. And again, you have lots of pieces of evidence that you include here. Um, so those were my big, you know, takeaways, if you will, because we're still in kind of the introduction portion. Anything else on chapter three there, John? Uh, no, just to remember that this was a white boy born in Newton, Kansas, 25 miles north of Wichita, um, who tried to sneak into the military and the army when he was 15 and got declined because he was underage, tried it again when he was 16, got declined again, and finally got in when he was 17, lasted less than a year, had an epileptic seizure, and he was separated from the army for medical reasons. 
Uh, and in that document at the bottom, which I didn't include the full document, but it says, you know, ineligible to serve again. He went to the Kansas National Guard, started taking rifle training. Um, and within a year, he was somehow magically back in the army again and off to Fort Knox and then off to Germany after that. So um, really, really interesting, his humble beginnings. And yeah, it was I think it was January, December or January, where I was probably two thirds of the way done with the book when I'm digging through information in Newton, Kansas and find out that when he was nine years old, they built a new elementary school and called it the Cooper Elementary School. And yeah. again, obviously that um, if you're making up a name, what do you make up a name with? Some people say it might be these comic books or Dan Cooper comics but the kid grew up in a town where he went to school at Cooper school. Yeah. I lived an hour away from uh, Newton. So um, it's, it's interesting the ties there. Okay. So we went into chapter four and uh, kind of the whole Cuba, Cuban missile crisis or, you know, the, the, all the issues of his work there. The one thing that you put in here that I thought um, I noted, I had a question on is um I'm on page 30. Um, he was shown a photo of Jack Ruby, um, at the prison guard, and it's confirmed. So I didn't follow this exactly. So this takeaway is that, so is it Loran Hall that was in the prison and that Ruby had visited him, correct? Yeah, so we kind of jumped forward to the fact that um... Paul goes to Oberammergau, Germany from Fort Knox in 1949. Um, he is in Oberammergau uh, in Garmisch because that is where the U.S. European counterintelligence school is. So Hall is taking classes in military policing. He becomes a military police officer. He's taking courses in provost marshal investigation. And he's obviously taking demolitions, explosives, and espionage as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, he even talks about later when he testifies to Congress that they were in rendition sessions where they would have slides flash of leaders and talk about potential um, need for assassinations in the future as well, too. So it's really interesting. He then gets plainclothes assignments throughout Germany on the border. He's uh, yeah, this is post World War II. Um, he's assigned to make sure the contraband isn't going illegally in and out of Germany. So he's doing that as plain clothes on the borders and getting that experience as well, too. He meets his first wife there and he was married three times. He meets his first wife, who was a English from England. She was a professional ice skater um, and was touring around with the ice capades. And they met in Germany. She returns uh, with him in 1952 to the United States. Um, they eventually have a total of four children. Um, two sons and then fraternal twins. Um, they moved to Omaha, Nebraska, where he works uh, on the other side of the river to the east for the Iowa National Guard. Uh, Omaha has at the time the largest sports book between Reno and Chicago, and Las Vegas doesn't exist at that time. So it was also known for casino activity. And in 1957, Lauren Hall also, also self admittedly to Congress, but through research I did, had a nervous breakdown while he was in Omaha. He spent two months in the Veterans Administration Hospital, was treated with Thorazine during that time. Um, in 1956, the year before that, he returned home and was arrested for check forgery. Um, and, um, you know, so just some weird inconsistencies with him, with his mental health, uh, things that are going on. And so they moved back to Kansas. And unfortunately, by 1958, his wife says, I've had enough. You can't keep a job. You're gone all the time. I don't know what you're doing. We're getting a divorce. She divorces him. She goes on welfare. He tells his parents, I got a friend in Miami who's got a job for me. So I'm going to go down there. Yeah. He, goes, he goes down there in 1958. The friend is probably somebody he met at the casino in Omaha. It's Santo Traficante's uh, brother. And for those of you that don't know okay. who Santo Traficante Jr. is, he's a major mafia figure, ran the casinos in Miami. Uh, and and uh, several of the casinos in Cuba, where mafia uh, people that own the casinos in Cuba made a ton of money under the Batista regime, which we can talk more about. So Paul goes to Miami and then goes to Cuba. 
but he doesn't go to Cuba just to work at a casino. He also agrees with the United States at the time who had supported Batista and his government um, for decades that had become extremely corrupt to the point where Batista was out of control and he had murdered up to 20,000 of his own people in Cuba to keep the corruption going and to silence people that were against him. And at that point, Eisenhower, the United States said, we've got to find someone else who's going to be able to come in um, that we can support, but that's going to get rid of all this corruption. They believed it was Castro. Um, they knew Castro potentially had communist leadings, but they felt confident that he was the right person at the time. So Lauren Hall and many others who had experience in um, work like Lauren all had decided he wanted to be a freedom fighter and go fight with Castro and Shea. And he went to the mountains of Cuba while he was there in 1958 and then returned again in 1959 to fight. Um, what happened though is Castro did take over and Castro after a little while said, I kind of like this Khrushchev guy. I think I'm going to go with him instead. Sorry about that. And I think I'm going to close your casinos and shut them down. Sorry about that. Well, this enraged the people that were Americans that had gone to fight for Castro, that he was choosing communism and Russia over the United States. In fact, some of them were still into 1961 in Cuba. Lauren Hall was not one of them. In Castro's army plotting against him. Lauren Hall in 1959 was actually gathering a group of Cubans that were within his control that he was going to go to Nicaragua to try to ensure that communism did not take hold in Nicaragua. He got arrested, whether it was Castro thinking it was the FBI, which is what's factually out there, but it still is potentially within question. He gets put in prison, but who does he get put in prison with? Well, it's not really a prison. It's kind of like what we call in the United States a country club prison. And they're in what's called a Quonset hut, which is like what's called a barracks. It has the tin roof that's rounded. And there's about seven or eight people that live in a Quonset hut. Well, Lauren Hall is in a Quonset hut with one of the largest mafia kingpins in the United States who is now living in Cuba. The, the people that are closestly associated to Santos Traficante are in this Quonset hut. And we know later, we find out that Lauren Hall, when he wasn't freedom fighting, was working or was helping at the Capri Casino or Casino Capri that Santos Traficante Jr. owned. I don't know if you guys remember the movie Goodfellow where Paul Sorvino's in prison, but they're letting him make spaghetti and lasagna and they have wine. Right. Well, in this Quonset hut, Santo Traficante had barrels of wine, <laughs> liquor. They bring trays of lasagna in every day. Castro was smart enough to know that if he didn't treat Traficante well during the transition, Traficante could have him killed, right? So he was so already Ruby playing was dangerous actually enough meeting with, by. Yeah, go ahead, Christy. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, Ruby was actually meeting with Traficante, not with, but they happened to coincidentally all be in the same Kwanzaa hut. Right. So Orion, in this prison, right? so yeah. in this prison where this is taking place, Two people, not just one, but I provide evidence that two people reported that Jack Ruby, so that if you don't know, the person who shot Lee Harvey Oswald and killed him was Jack Ruby in Dallas, Texas, uh, two days after President Kennedy was assassinated. Um, Ruby was involved with the mafia. Ruby uh, was involved uh, with the, he was admittedly, the FBI admitted that he had been an informant in the 1950s to the FBI. There's rumors that he had actually worked for Congressman Richard Nixon uh, in the 1950s, but he went from Chicago and relocated in Dallas, also traveled to New Orleans, which attached him to some of the, if you think of the Jim Garrison, Oliver Stone stuff, that Ruby knew those people. Mm -hmm. Ruby was actually looking to offload Jeeps into Cuba and take dilapidated Jeeps in the US, service them and sell them to Castro uh, during that time. Um, he visited Tiscornia Prison, the name of the prison is Tiscornia Prison, at least two occasions uh, to meet with Traficante. And we have a British journalist that was imprisoned at Tiscornia that reported to MI6 and to the United States Embassy in Mexico City 
that a gangster named Ruby had visited them. And then you have the prison guard, as you mentioned, and I actually put the actual document number mm -hmm. if people want to research it that is in the Kennedy files and the Department of Justice files that stated that he identified the man who had visited as Jack Ruby. So that's when this starts to, again, get tinfoil hatty, nutsy cuckoo with the book that I wrote that Lauren Hall's relationship with someone involved in the Kennedy assassination, potentially Santos Traficante and Jack Ruby started back in 1959, you know, four years before the Kennedy yeah, assassination. Yeah, could it be a coincidence? Like, can you, con can you convict in a court of law? No, but you don't even need a tinfoil hat. I mean, this is getting like, it can't be just a coincidence. With, and, and Hall I mean, in 1970, Hall, Hall testifies to the fact that he was in, he was with, in prison with Traficante. Yeah. Um, and, and goes through the whole nine yards. He's actually immunized. He's given immunity by the HSC in 1977 to come and testify for two days. So he's testifying mm -hmm. without fear of, of, of uh, any legal proceedings against him. Um, I still think he was dishonest about his alibi uh, based on the evidence that I present there, but there's no question that he admits that all of that is true uh, yeah. under oath to Congress. Yeah. Okay, so now we're transitioning. He's kind of, you say, new wife, new life, chapter five. Um, we kind of get into his personal life. He's kind of, I don't know, re rehabilitating himself, even though he's still dabbling in a little bit of um, criminal issues. But um, yeah, because, you know, he kind of really does have an up and down situation of his life. He's a freedom fighter, but then, you know, drug trafficking and lots of issues, um, I think. He has very different chapters of his life. Um, that's how exactly I put it. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and then the John Birch Society, and um, which is this right-wing political av um, advocacy group. Um, you talk a little bit about that, and then we get to 1963. This is where right. um, I feel now this is the first six chapters that really give a good foundation of kind of what is happening um, with him and what's happening in the world. And it helped me because Again, I, I was minus 13 years old at this time. So right. I really needed to get that basis, even though I did read the books and get the foundation. Um, and yeah, Christy, then, just, just, just one yeah. point of the prior chapter. So his second wife, Ann Pappas, who was 37, he was 30 at the time he met her. Uh, she had been divorced. Uh, he was divorced, as I had mentioned earlier. She had the three sons that I mentioned earlier, the two boys that are in the uh, uh, the Pappas brothers that are in that article. She was the executive assistant for the plant manager of Cessna, and which is an airlines, uh, for those of you that aren't aware, have you heard of a Cessna aircraft? Um, and that plant manager oversaw all of the test pilots, all the manufacturing, all the engineers there. She herself went through their program in 1958 and became a pilot and actually raced in a woman's sky derby for Cessna. There's a picture of her in a Cessna uniform in 1959. Um, we, I believe that Skip Hall met her because to be part of this group that he's going to join called Interpen, that we don't have to get into if we don't have time to tonight into the details of that. But he actually gets his student pilot license uh, to become a pilot. I believe that's where how they met. Um, and they move out to California after that, which we'll get into as well, too. Yeah. But that's yeah. important more for the D.B. Cooper story on what's his knowledge of aviation. Would he ever have been in the company of people that might be working with titanium? Uh, did he have a knowledge of aircraft, airplane, flying? And that's what those that chapter sets up before we get into the, the part where you're at right now. Yeah. And Cynthia, if you have any questions on any of these chapters, chime in. Um, I'm just going to keep chugging along. So now we're at 1963, and this is when um, you put in kind of the key facts. It, it comes out after, but I'm appreciative that you put it in before because it lays the foundation of how um, uh, he is involved with um, the JFK assassination. He flat out admits he was offered $50,000 to assassinate the president. So it's not like he he wasn't a person that could have done this i mean he he actually testifies that yes he he was offered that at a time which um which i found fascinating and then also this whole idea of even the, is he white or could he be mexican looking and i'm going to show you guys the picture um yes he's a white man you know living in kansas but he he fits the the criteria 
and I know this will be important later for the D.B. Cooper community, olive skin type of thing. He was white, but he definitely could have passed either Mexican looking or, all, you know, olive skinned as well. So again, it's yeah, kind for of the, uh, for the for the John Birch. So when he joined the uh, was part of the John Birch Society and moved out to California, when he first went over to Cuba in 58, he said, hey, what will my name be in Spanish? My name's Lauren Hall. And they said Lorenzo Pasillo. So that was his Cuban freedom fighting name. Oh. And when he came back and gave speeches for the John Birch Society, there's actually a photo in the book, a newspaper clipping of him. People thought he was Cuban. He gave speeches for oh. money as Lorenzo Pasillo, Cuban freedom fighter from the United States. And he played it up because he knew he could get paid more money if people thought he was from Cuba talking about how bad Castro was and how important it was for the United States to end communism. So these, the John Birch Society was a very right-wing organization uh -huh. and very anti-communist. And so those groups ate it up and paid him hundreds and hundreds of dollars into the thousands of dollars, which were going back into the 1960s. was a heck of a lot of money. It's a heck of a lot of money today. But we're talking the equivalent of being paid thousands of dollars to give you know, one hour speech to a, a club in Anaheim or Santa Clara or at Knott's oh. Berry Farm, um, which he would go around and do as Lorenzo Pesillo. Yep. Okay. Now we're moving into chapter eight. Um, and that's not what Jerry said, chapter. So this is really getting into his um, testimony, kind, kind of where, what is his association with Dallas um, and it lays a little bit of the foundation too of the the magic bullet and kind of the stuff you talked about at the beginning of tonight's um, conversation. Um, so yeah. again, laying the foundation where it's almost like they're separate pieces and parts and they're all going to get tied up together um, in a nice little Christmas gift with a bow on top of it. Um, and, but that's where we're getting, this will be the last chapter until we then move over to the Cooper part. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of that this is really the lead up to your point, and I'll be brief on yeah. what was he doing in 1963 leading up to the assassination? Well, he's part of this group called Interpen, International Penetration Force, led by former people that were special forces or had counterintelligence training. And they were training Cubans and other people in the Florida Keys at a place called No Name Key to get ready to do attacks on Cuba, send boats in, parachute in. They actually did parachute training. And in 1960, there's uh, 61, there's an article that actually gets syndicated throughout the country. And it shows Jerry Hemming, who's this six foot six former Green Beret uh, parachuting expert who's running this group called Interpen. Interestingly, in that article, is or the art of series of articles that came out in the Miami Herald to start out with and then throughout the country was a man named Frank Fiorini. Well, Frank Fiorini later changes his name to Frank Sturgis. And if that name doesn't sound familiar, Frank Sturgis was involved 11 years later in the Watergate burglary. So he was part of this group with that Lauren Hall was in back in, which is just crazy to think about it. But if you look up Frank Sturgis, Frank Sturgis was one of the guys that went to Cuba to freedom fight like Lauren Hall. He was involved with the Bay of Pigs. He was involved with all those things and then all the way through with Nixon to Watergate. Uh, the point is, let's look at Lauren Hall's travels from Carol, uh, California to Dallas to Miami where this group is. He relocates with his wife to California. They are buying old machine guns that have been filled in with lead on the end. They're pulling the old barrels off, not pulling, removing them, putting new ones on. He's taking this young man, John Pappas, the youngest son of his new wife, to the San Gabriel gun range, and they're firing off machine guns. And this kid's 19 years old. I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. Uh, he was in awe of, of Skip. So, uh, And then they're loading up ammunition. They're getting hospital supplies, and they're driving them through Dallas, getting money from right-wing oil people and people that want to support the cause to get rid of Castro and then taking either getting money for boats and things and then taking these arms to Miami down to the Keys to then have as part of the raids that they're doing or supply uh, insurgents that are going into Cuba to do this. Hall admits that he was in Dallas, Texas five times okay. in 1963. 
President Kennedy was killed in Dallas in November of 1963. Hall says the last time he was there was in late October to potentially early November. Um, part of the evidentiary of that chapter that I mentioned that we'll get to is, don't think that's true, but this is what he's doing. He's a Cuban freedom fighter. He's giving speeches for the John Birch Society. Um, and he's traversing back and forth with other people that are part of these groups uh, from West Covina, all these, this East F LA area, which is a big CIA area. Um, and uh, was where the Cuban consulate was for people that were against Castro, was also in Monterey Park uh, in East LA. So um, that's what Hall's doing in the lead up to the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. Well, and so the next chapter is really interesting because I didn't think of it this way. But if you look at this guy, you don't really think where we have seen the D.B. Cooper, you know, mugshot, if you will, or the sketch. But if you reverse engineer, let's take his, let's take off his uh, uh, facial hair. He really does bear a remarkable resemblance uh, with the different pictures that we have of him. He kind of goes from this scruffy, I don't know, militarist looking guy I'll just say he cleans up well. I mean, he really does have a look that could fit. Um, I, I think the perfect one or the one that I like best is that one. Um, of and there's you put you provide many in the book, um, but I think it was the first time that I thought to myself how DB Cooper could have uh, disguised himself is if he always has facial hair just taking it all off during the time of the hijacking and then growing it right back again. I, I, I don't know why I'd never thought about that before, but I did. Yeah. It's like Mike and I grew up watching Glenn Fry in Miami Vice shave his beard off and comb his hair in the bathroom. Right. I mean, Mike, Mike could mess his hair up, go out, rob a bank right now, come home, shave, shave his head and not take his glasses off and not look like the sketch. Cause Mike is a master of counterintelligence. It's yeah, true. and if he shaves his beard, he's in big trouble. That's I, he does. He looks totally different without. And I think you you laid it out well in that chapter of how um, that really could be. And then you go into um, the voices as well. And then we move into chapter eleven is when I think we're really going to start to dig into um, like the the Dan Cooper comic, which I'm still asking for. Mike got me the English version of it. Um, I think a Christmas ago, and I'm like, no, no, a French one. <laughs> I need the French one because then it needs to be translated, which I know D.B. Cooperites have done. Um, but um, I think that also leaves a good foundation of kind of, you know, D.B. Cooper. And there are some great pictures of the comic book um, as well. But one of the huge, um, I think, mysteries that we have is this whole Elsinore ghost. So you put this in Chapter 12. I'd love you to just hit the summary of it. Um, and just as an aside, my dad was a West Covina sheriff. So it is so funny oh, that nice. that's the neck of the woods that I grew up in. So I kind of know this area. And I've only sky jumped or skydived once, and it was at Lake Elsinore. So it's so Elsinore. funny that these connections. Hit. Right. So when you think about that corridor going west to El Monte and then Monterey Park, yep. Lauren Hall and his wife first moved to Pasadena, then they moved to Monterey Park, and then they moved to West Covina. Um, so yep. that was where they ended up before uh, they split. And uh, the Elsinore ghost story is something really weird that we all kind of scratch our head about because it connect has a connection to the JFK case. But uh, the Elsinore Jump Center was a jump center located about pretty close to an hour uh, southeast of Los Angeles. And... Uh, um, you know, back in the day, we won't talk about traffic today in L.A., but back then in the, in the 60s, you could potentially get down there if you were outside of the city of Los Angeles in about an hour from a place like uh, West Covina that you're talking about. Um, that is where um, the CIA trained jumpers uh, that's known. It's where a group called Paraventures jumped and they actually filmed a TV show from 1960 to 1962 called Ripcord, which is, you know, you pull the ripcord when you parachute. Uh, it was a popular show on TV. There was a gentleman that uh, then took over for the originators, and his name was Lyle Cameron at the Jump Center. Uh, and Lyle Cameron was a highly accomplished uh, jumper, and in fact, ending up ended up being the president of the United States parachute team um, and uh, worked out of Lake Elsinore. 
Um, a week after the Cooper hijacking, uh, unsolicited Lyle Cameron calls the FBI to give a report that sometime in either late July or August of 1971, someone fitting the description that has now been released about D.B. Cooper came in to the Elsinore Jump Center wearing the same type of jump, military jump boots that someone would wear, uh, had Raleigh cigarette coupons. And this person fitting the description of D.B. Cooper, Dan Cooper, was asking questions about how you would parachute out of a commercial airline and specific questions about the plane configuration, how it would be done. And Cameron thought this could be the guy. So he calls the FBI and gives this report. Lyle Cameron, if you go to the Black Vault, blackvault.com, Lyle Cameron, uh, had been an informant at certain times for the FBI, was a skilled pilot. And this is like one of those tinfoil hat things that freaks everybody out in the JFK community and the D.B. Cooper community, is the day before Lee Harvey Oswald was killed by Jack Ruby, there are phone records between Lyle Cameron's phone and Jack Ruby's phone yeah. in Texas. So Jack yeah, Ruby was trying to figure out everything on a way that he could somehow get out of killing Ruby, which if you study the case, Ruby was everywhere and he was calling the police department and saying, you got to protect this guy. And, and he still ends up killing Oswald. But why he would be calling Lyle Cameron, um, you know, uh, is, is beyond. And then Lyle Cameron's filling out, filing this, you know, there's an FBI agent filing a 302 report that Lyle Cameron is, is one of the weirdest things. I do prove throughout my research that this Jerry Hemming, this parachuting expert that Paul was associated with in Interpen, not only jumped at Elsinore because he went to El Monte High School and grew up in the area out there, that, that he jumped at the Elsinore Jump Center and had access to the jumpers cards there. And John Pappas shocked me because I had asked him earlier in a conversation if he had ever talked to Skip about parachuting because John's a pilot incredibly accomplished pilot, owned his own DC-3, flew it to Normandy. He's got over 15,000 flight hours. This is the eight-year-old man who was 19 years old. So he's a serious dude, fun dude, but he's a serious guy who's not making up a story about a Carcano rifle because uh, he needs the money or he wants to become famous about it. He would have probably done it years ago if that was the case. But he said, oh yeah, I remember jumping at Elsinore. I remember landing hard on my heel and my knee swelled up like a grapefruit and we had a good enough relationship i'm like and you couldn't have told me that you know so i had to ended add that into the book right before in january um, he gave me that information but you now had someone who lived with warren hall and the guy who he was in no name key with and all of 1963 had met in at Tiscornia prison hall came and actually visited them at Tiscornia prison in 1959. So Hall had met Jerry Hemming in 1959. Yeah. These guys were all associated with the Elsinore Jump Center and somebody fitting the description of D.B. Cooper through that 302 report by Lyle Cameron, probably sometime in August, came in asking questions about how you jump out of a commercial airplane. Well, um, yeah. There's people that don't believe that story, don't believe right. Cameron. They say Cameron later recanted or said, well, I'd written about it in a magazine. We don't know if somebody called Cameron and said, hey, shut the F up. Right. You know, you stop talking about this D.B. Cooper stuff. We have no idea. So there's some people who really believe the Elsinore ghost story, and there's some people who say, nah, maybe not. Well, and wasn't it not only, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I've only read a little bit into this after the Pat and uh, Darren on the Vortex talked about it, and I talked a little bit with Nikki about it, is not only did he did this Elsinore ghost go in and talk about tell me about hijacking, but he wanted specifically to know about the Northwest and what are drop areas in the Northwest. And supposedly he had a Raleigh cigarette um, coupon or something in his pocket and Raleigh cigarettes had not been out publicly yet that the, the, the actual D.B. Cooper was smoking Raleigh cigarettes. So he had that bit of knowledge or that bid, that, that specific data point that was not public yet. That is what I had heard about two other reasons the Elsinore ghost was so interesting. That's right. He asked about jump centers in the in the up north in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. yeah. There are also people that believe that Cameron was 
planting that story to make D.B. Cooper seem like a criminal if it is actually something that was done by the government or to stop hijackings and air safety in the future and so on and so forth. So uh, there's all different thoughts on that, but you're right. Pat did a Cooper Vortex. For, that, for, the, for those of you that aren't aware, there's a wonderful board, uh, podcast that started in 2018 by a guy named Darren Schaefer called the Cooper Vortex, and he interviews experts and people with all different ideas. He interviewed Stephanie and Mindy in one of the episodes uh, back when their book came out. And I believe there's now 74 episodes of that podcast, and they're great listens if you have any interest in the D.B. Cooper case. He had to be like 12 when he started that, because that was 2018. And so he, he is young, but he is so articulate. Probably one of the nicest humans. I, have met, I met him at CooperCon and said, can I buy you a beer? And he's like, you can buy me the first beer, but we'll just sit and chat as long as you want. And, and we did. And he talked about a wealth of knowledge. He had a lot of information on Ha 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 that I wasn't aware of at all. And just right. everything. He, and he just seemed very um, evidence-based as well. He's like, here's my opinion, but let me give you the data and then you get to decide. Because he doesn't seem to have a very, he has his opinions, but he understands that it's separate from what he does. And I just think his interviewing skills are phenomenal. He hosted the first CooperCon I went to, which I yeah, looked 50, up and 50 was just, anniversary. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was awesome. So, okay. We are now on page 99. We are over an hour in. So I don't, yeah. Wrap it up. I, Mike's like, wrap it up. Well, we, I could do another hour next week with you, but I don't want to dominate too much of your time. I know you're on the author circuit. So um, the, the <laughs> key takeaways that I hit at this point, um, I, I'd like you to talk about the tie because I do think the tie is important. Um, it was left, which D.B. Cooper didn't want to leave anything, but he seemed to have left it by accident. Some people say not, but that same model tie, let's say, was also seen and you have some evidence. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about that and then I'll hit a couple of the, the big data points. Yeah, so Cooper um, did leave allegedly some evidence on the plane. We talked about the cigarette butts earlier. That flight had originated in Washington, D.C., flew to Minneapolis, stopped in Montana twice to pick up Skippy, just kidding, and then flew to Portland, um, where uh, D.B. Cooper hijacked the plane uh, in mid-afternoon uh, for its last leg that was supposed to be in Seattle, where can you imagine the pilots and the flight attendants flying all day, thinking they're a half an hour away from getting off the plane and heading to a hotel and having a great dinner to what they actually went through that evening is pretty incredible. But to your point, Christy, um, they had, uh, sometimes there are those white either cloths over the back of the top of a seat on a plane if you're on them and they change those so that you're not, you know, touching with the other people that may have sat on a flight previous to you. On that flight, they were actually made of paper and on the seat back that D.B. Cooper sat in and based on the evidence that, the testimony, no one sat in that back row on the previous legs of the flight. There was a hair on that piece of paper that they took and put in a slide. And just like the cigarette butts, nobody knows where that slide is. So it's another piece of evidence that's gone missing from the DB Cooper Probably case. in Vegas. Yeah. I have um, contacted the, I thought I really had a good in with the FBI um, Vegas office. I thought I was going to be able to rummage through some old stuff. I kind of got... Um, halted on that because I just thought between losing and destroying if we could get some of the evidence back it would be incredible um, but yeah so so that tie though we have Loran Hall photographed in that tie in right? a clip-on tie I mean it yeah. looks very similar and that photograph is 1968 so the clip-on tie that's left on the seat literally on the seat that D.B. Cooper was sitting in some people believe that may have been a mistake by him he was in haste, getting ready. He's taking a, tying up a Looney Tunes bag full of money. He had asked for a knapsack. They actually brought it in one of those canvas bags from the Seattle First Bank. Um, and uh, he literally, instead of demanding a knapsack or they go get one off of a kid in the airport, starts MacGyvering one of the reserve chutes, cutting the shroud lines and tying up the Looney Tune bag to make it a carry bag or a drag bag, if you're familiar with, with skydiving. Um, and uh, does that, but had taken his tie off. It's a clip-on tie. Mike, I don't know what most guys do when they get home after work, take their tie off, boom, throw it down on the seat, or uh -huh. certainly don't hang it up in the closet right away. But that tie was left on the seat. 
Uh, it's one of the pieces of evidence collected. There's some partial palm, palm prints and some potential partial prints. Most experts still believe that he obfuscated his fingerprints, whether he put crazy glue on them or some type of glue to keep the away. But it was called a snapper tie. It's a thin tie, so it was made uh, by J.C. Penney at Troundcraft and distributed between 1964 and 65. So it would have been purchased. That tie was often purchased in bulk for the service industry. Busboys, bartenders, uh, waiters um, would wear that type of tie. And uh, this information all came from the investigation to J.C. Penney. When I found that photo during the time of the Garrison investigation in 1968, Ryan Burns and I looked very close to the tie that Lauren Hall is wearing. And you can actually see that that white piece because Snapper made it white. So you didn't see a piece of metal going over the collar. It actually looked white. That Lauren Hall is actually wearing a thin clip-on tie in 1968 in that photo. So whether or not that's the D.B. Cooper tie, it would be crazy if you have him testifying to Jim Garrison and he's wearing the same tie um, you know, testifying about the Kennedy assassination uh, that he is on flight 305. But I'm not aware of any other suspects that I know of or people where we can say we have a definitive photo of them actually wearing a clip-on tie that matches the D.B. Cooper time that was worn at the time that a tie like that would have been purchased and still be being worn by someone. It's important to know that Lauren Hall at that time was living in a place called um, Kernville, California on Lake Isabella, uh, uh, just east of uh, Bakersfield. And he and his wife had owned a, a motel and a home. Talk about people we know who owned a motel by a river. Um, they had a motel on the Kern River. And, uh, and small, it was named small, Rainbow, right? Am it was I named right? the Rainbow Motel. That's correct. Uh, there was a terrible flood in December, early December 1966, one of the worst floods in California history. Over 100 mobile homes were washed away from Currentville, and their hotel that was on the banks of the river was destroyed along with their home. After that, Lauren Hall was bartending at a bar in uh, Wofford Heights, which is also on Lake Isabella, called Duffy's. And again, the J.C. Penney snapper tie was told that it was mostly worn by busboys, bartenders, and waiters. So just very interesting that all of that None of that proves that he was D.B. Cooper, and I'm not saying he was D.B. Cooper, but you keep adding all these things together right. with his physical appearance, his history, his background, the things that you'll learn later if you go into detail in the book. Right. And that's where that clip on tie comes into play. Yeah, that's where I want you guys to buy that. Somebody said, oh, if you're going to go through every chapter, I won't need to read the book. Yeah, we're not going to go. We, we've hit highlights. Yeah, we're not going to read the 300, the 22 pages of testimony to the House Select Committee on Assassinations, because right. even I would leave. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cynthia, what was your question? You said that you had one big question. What was it? Yeah, so there there were two different um, flight attendants on the D.B. Cooper flight, right? Three, and, they're three. Both, and, and they're all still living, right? That's correct. All three are still alive. Have, you, have you talked to them in person about your book? You and no, Tina, I have not. <laughs> and, and, and most of us would have a very difficult time. And the one that spent the most time with uh, Dan Cooper on the flight she was actually in the middle section of the plane. So they, they had kind of like a business class person with the most seniority. Her name was Alice Hancock. In the middle of the plane was the youngest of the three. Her name was Tina Mucklow. She was the blonde haired flight attendant. And then Florence Schaffner was at the rear of the plane. Florence was the one that D.B. Cooper handed the original hijacking note to. She took it up to the cockpit. They kept her there because she was pretty shaken up. And Tina is given a lot of credit because she was very young and kept it together the whole time and even joked around with Cooper at certain times and just did a magnificent job. In fact, uh, uh, one of the uh, the co-pilot of flight gets emotional talking about her, thinking, you know, this is a woman who's now my middle daughter's age. And I'm thinking about how my middle daughter, my own middle daughter, would have reacted to being a flight attendant on a plane that was being hijacked. And Tina did a magnificent job. She has actually uh, produced in a documentary that's scheduled to come out called Not If You Understand. And guess what? Everybody in the D.B. Cooper community has no idea when it's gonna come out, Cynthia. Have you ever heard of a documentary where you <laughs> don't know when it's actually gonna come out? But uh, well, that's the reason why she's basically now not talking to anybody because she's involved in this documentary. Uh, I do know that there are people in the Cooper community that have been in touch with Florence and uh, Alice Hancock. And I believe that there is, um, 
a female in our community that is in contact with one of them pretty significantly to the point where the they're talking about it. But the people sent me on that plane, the three flight attendants and uh, the flight engineer, the co-pilot, the pilot really kind of got disgusted and fed up with um, all the attention they were getting after this thing. And really many of them did not like the public scrutiny. Um, uh, the co-pilot has probably been the most vocal of the three that were in the cockpit on talking about what happened specifically as an employee of like, you know, he retired from, uh, Northwest uh, Airlines, but uh, I have not talked to any of them. I'll put my two cents. Tina is the equivalent in our community of what Zoe thinks about the chase. A key <laughs> person, but her opinions would be, and in an upcoming documentary, but not probably with the same message of, you know, there there is some discussion in the D.B. Cooper community. Is D.B. Cooper this hero or is he really just a criminal? Um, I think Tina was scarred more than most. And so, uh, again, I think it's the exact equivalent. Zoe is to Tina what Tina is to Zoe between the two communities. My my other question to John is, do you know if, if the three flight attendants or the pilot, co-pilot have read your new book? I do not. I do not. I, do not. Um, I think that... There's people in the community that could probably find that out, but it's only been, I think, three and a half weeks or four weeks since it's come out. And uh, it's just kind of now picking up more steam than it has. So it's kind of an uh, interesting time in the cycle. I have been told that there are people now that um, are hearing from people that have been in the Cooper community for a long time and are taking it seriously, that it's getting more traction. And Darren has invited me on. I think right now we're scheduled to do the Cooper Vortex recording on uh, next Friday or this Friday. Um, I haven't talked to him since uh, Friday. But once that comes out, Darren has, I think, between twenty or 30,000 subscribers. And I do know a lot of people that are involved from the Cooper community uh, will listen to that. And uh, I think that will be kind of the next wave of people potentially taking Warren Hall seriously. Um, I don't know if Larry Carr has read it either. Um, I don't, I, I think he would probably want a synopsis on Hall and, uh, you know, take a look at him. Interestingly, in my opinion, and Larry Carr was the FBI agent who handled the case from 2007 to 2010. He's now retired and he's part of the Cooper community. He'll be at CooperCon again this year. But my, um, I believe Lauren Hall fits the profile that Larry has given. He gave it with Darren, if you want to listen to Larry's episode on the Cooper Vortex, except for the fact that Larry still maintains he believes Cooper died that. So, but other than that, the um, the, the description of how, what who Larry thinks as a veteran of the FBI for decades on what his profile was, Lauren Hall is literally an exact match for that. Well, you'll get a kick out of this, Cynthia. So. Um, when Larry Carr got on the case for the FBI for the, the the D.B. Cooper, he decided to just go on the main forum because he was like, this is stalemated. You guys are so interested in it. I want to engage with you. And no one believed it was him because it was like the FBI had said nothing. And then once he was like confirmed as the actual FBI agent, it really broke the things loose. And really that interaction, I think, is what helped, I mean, not get a solution, but at least get enough information on both sides to really help the investigation, to help the people that were interested in it. But I just think it's so funny that he just went on a forum and put it, you know, said, hi, I'm the FBI agent. People are like, no, you're not. And he's like, yeah, I am. And I don't know how they confirmed it, but they confirmed it that it was him. And then he was, he talked at the last CooperCon. He's going to be at the next one. Um, so, okay, guys. So you need to go and buy this book and you need to go to CooperCon. If you haven't been to CooperCon, it is so much fun. Everybody is so nice. Um, and you get to kind of see every, and it's kind of the star studded event this year. I don't know how they got so many. It's like one year they got the passenger on the plane. One year they got Larry and one year they got th this person that this year they seem to have gotten everybody. I mean, except the, the stewardesses, but, or flight attendants, but everybody else, like the, the daughter of one of the co-pilots is going to be there and a few others like that. So um, I highly recommend this book. I'm going to talk about it more in our Discord, um, so I won't give away every chapter. And I'll probably tag Packer Jack for his thoughts. Um, so I did want to thank, yes, we've gone way over. I want to thank Mike, you know, dominating the conversation again. But I love this well, book. And 
I, I'm really excited about it. Well, there is a question from the chat. Uh, Mike N says, is any of the cut spare shoe cordage going to be DNA tested? Oh, uh, the core. Well, that, that's 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 a really interesting conversation because it's being held at uh, a university museum. Um, it's been requested by people in the community. Yeah. Um, there's people that believe latent DNA wouldn't still exist on it, so on and so forth. There's questions of if it's not being accessible because the FBI might do something. Uh, Pat Boland, who's a friend of mine who you guys have had on the show, um, you know, has really been working to try to get access to that parachute. Um, Eric and Tom have been working on the tie. Tom K is the scientist who uh, Larry Carr uh, picked as part of the group called C Citizen Sleuths to do the testing on the tie. Tom has his own high powered electron microscopes and did all the testing to identify those pieces. So Mike, it's a really good question on would anybody ever be getting, given access to that parachute that is in Washington state right now for DNA testing to be done? And the answer right now is no, as far as I know. Yeah, and it was oh, yes before. Is. And that's what's so odd is they had Tom in and gave Tom access because the idea that Pat had, which I think is a brilliant one, is when you go into the cards or if you touch the shroud lines, um, you will you will have DNA rub off. And if you did, let's get access to that. It's not with the FBI, it's with the private museum. They have had Tom in before testing other things. All of a sudden, last minute, they said no. They will not give access to the same guy they've already given access. Some people are saying it's because the FBI has reopened the investigation unofficially. Um, one of the other suspect's sons, I guess, were asked for a DNA sample. So it sounds like kind of on the down low, the FBI is reinvestigating um, because that's where I will give Eric Euless tons of credit. Man, he keeps this case in the middle of the the. Um, the news wire all the time things are coming out and i think that's really put pressure i think either in a good or bad way on the fbi to either act or do something it sounds like they're doing something on the down low um but eric's really kind of pushed the envelope he tried to sue for the tie he lost but he won in court of public opinion with the press and things so i think they're everybody's doing a good job of this is a very very active case especially for being 50 years later Right. Well, it, it truly is the only unsolved hijacking in United States history. And you think of the uh, over a hundred other ones that have been all solved. They've all been solved. Yep. The, F, the FBI is shooting 99.9% .9 on these. And this is the last one that's, that's left that hasn't been figured out. So, yep. Well, last question. Cheryl asks, uh, Packer Jack, what do you think Loran's motivation uh, was to do a hijacking to extort money? Yeah, that's a great question, Cheryl. And I do a chapter where I give at least kind of 15 suppositions on why it really is a fielder's choice with this guy. Well, personal reasons. Um, he had he did have inconsistencies in his life. He had committed crime. You know, I mentioned the check forgery in 56. He marries this beautiful second wife in 1960. And in 1961, he's arrested for shoplifting in Wichita. So it's just... What's going on in his brain? He did have a relative, his only sibling, lived in the Seattle area at the time of the hijacking. Was he going to visit? Uh, did he need money to get back in the game, to, to get a block of big bag of cash to buy weapons and get back in the game in Nicaragua or Cuba? Um, what was he doing? And one of the things we didn't get into is he becomes Walter White later in his life. Uh, he's running a meth lab. He's the cook and the kingpin of a meth lab in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. He's going down to Costa Rica, Nicaragua during the Iran-Contra time, which Mike, I know you're very familiar with, Colonel Oliver North and what mm -hmm. happened uh, back then. And his three adult children get arrested. They get federally sentenced to prison time. He's finally extradited at age 60, brought back to Wichita. They talk about a court hearing the next week. Never hear anything in the press about it ever again. He supposedly served time, but no one can prove it. And his obituary says, Lauren Eugene Hall, 65, retired Boeing, Wichita superintendent. So for a man that was facing 20 years in prison and a million dollar fine for being a drug kingpin, John Pappas, um, members of his family that I'm talking to now, Paul Tash, 
believe he got a little don't do anything like that again while his three kids actually went to prison for it. So um, he was a self-described jackal for the CIA. We didn't bring that word up too much because I know we're all sensitive about mentioning the CIA. But um, he uh, he okay, was obviously so involved with the CIA. Him. There's no there's but, no bones about it. He was involved with the CIA. Well, and we know no bones about it. So as for as Fenn, what is the tie between <laughs> tie play on words pun last question and then we can go to speakeasy for anybody who wants to because I'm excited about this and all the other stuff in the Treasure Hunting Amusement Park. But we have we have Shiloh Saint Loran. This guy's name's Loran. CIA, CIA. Forrest talked about <laughs> training down in South Florida that Cynthia brought up to me. I, uh, what say you, Packer Jack? I say go to Discord and check it out. <laughs> just seems like everybody involved is shady. I mean, you got the mob, you got Cuba, you got all the just all these guys just running these same circles. So I could definitely see him pulling off something like this. With Forrest. Forrest I don't know. Forrest. I don't know if I call Forrest shady, but that's a whole other know. conversation. I'm saying Forrest no, I think Forrest no. I might be totally wrong. I think there is some sort of a connection, and that's why you had a couple chapters. But they, uh, it would have caused some confusion and things you'd said of your editor's right. feedback. I think there is a connection. I don't think Forrest was D.B. Cooper. I actually think there's a tie here that might all come full circle later. Um, but I do think it's pretty odd that the only time we've ever had Shiloh in our chat, he just oddly shouts out Loran, spelled the exact same way. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Put my little tinfoil hat on fine. I, I I don't know. Rather odd to me. Maybe it'll come out someday. Maybe there'll be a sequel to John's book. You never know. Um, will you be able to join us on Discord, John? Uh, I will check with my much better half, as you guys know. There's okay. not a high bar there, but she is really spectacular. And I'll let you guys know what's going on. My next book is called Where Was Mike? Uh, sorry, Mike. <laughs> Christy and I have been working on it with Cynthia. We just wanted to surprise <laughs> you tonight and let you know it comes out in three months. Uh, I'll be happy to find out where I'm at, too, half the time. Uh, all right, everybody, we do have a Discord channel. The link is down below in the description, and we get in there and talk about all things Forest Fan and Treasure Hunts, and now I think D.B. Cooper. So the list just grows on. So thanks for coming on, John. We appreciate it. It's Thank you, guys. Call. Like everybody, I said, uh, check it out. I just thanks to Forest Fan too, and the community. This wouldn't have happened. Uh, without it so we try to well, we spend a lot of time often talking about the negative stuff associated with it but there's always a lot of positive stuff associated with forest and i like to think about the positives when i think about forest Fenton. yeah for sure uh the book is available on amazon that link is down below in the description as well so if you're interested in db cooper go pick it up gives a different perspective so thanks everybody uh thanks, we are gonna go live thursday 6 p.m pacific nice. and we get a bunch of stuff to talk about thursday we have so a lot to talk about. We have a there lot. Uh-oh. Forest mm -hmm. CIA references. There it is. Uh-oh. Moscow, 1976. Okay, so on Thursday, we have an update on JCB's hunt. We have the lion, Justin, speaking out, or at least speaking to us, which we will speak out about. Uh, we have the invitation. This will be our last show before our launch. So Thursday, we're going to be talking about those things. And much, much more. I don't know all the details yet because in two days, three days, a lot can develop. But that's what we already have in store. That's why we're doing a special show um, because Thursday um, or Monday, we launched. We launched the invitation and we're nowhere near the sales of our esteemed author <laughs> colleague. But um, our pre-sales, I thought we could just prepare 50 and be fine. Oh, no, we're preparing more and more and more. So thank you guys all for buying in up to this point but um it's 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 catching it's catching wildfire so we'll be in discord thanks i bought mine thank you i bought mine already can't wait to get it excited yeah. I, I heard about this uh raider rick guy i'm kind of curious to see <laughs> raider, ryan. Raider, rick. raider ryan well, yeah, it might be based loosely on somebody you'll 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 you might get a kick out of it when you read it john you too cynthia so all right everybody uh we'll see you next time we'll see you thursday thanks thanks guys yeah. Bye, see you. See you guys.